It's a great pleasure for me to be here, uh, even though you can't hear a word I'm saying. <laughs> but that's probably going to be improved presently. Now, if I were in the audience today and someone got introduced as presenting a lecture on U.S. energy supplies for the next hundred years, or better yet, for the 21st century, my immediate reaction would be, he's wrong. And then I would have to think a while and I would have to say, well, I've done this before. I did this in 1973 in the first issue of uh, Nuclear News. And it was wrong. And so I'm going to try to correct that manuscript today, or maybe more properly say, update that manuscript, to give you some idea on what might well happen during the 21st century. Now, since I'm going to be speaking at the, uh, at the end of the lecture about my preferences for the future, you may conclude that I'm a nuclear nut because my recommendations are going to relate to mostly to nuclear energy. But I want to disabuse you of this idea because in point of fact, when I started to work on energy problems, I worked on energy conservation. You may have heard about that. Then I had a business, I was in a business, to produce biomass for energy. And after that, for many years, in the Carter administration, the Reagan administration, the Bush administration, and even the Clinton administration, I worked for many years on fossil fuels, which is my primary, which has been my primary area in the energy research field. So when, after all that, I come out with a strong nuclear bias, you have to look upon me as converted. I think that's the right <laughs> word. <laughs> now let me start out by showing you what might happen. And the best way to do that, I believe, is to begin with an overview of energy resources. Now we use this word advisedly, an energy resource is something that we know is there, but that is not necessarily recoverable with current technology. It has to be a reserve before that is the case. The ratio of resources to reserves is quite large, perhaps a factor of three. But as time goes on with better technology, resources tend to become reserves and new resources are found. So what I'm going to show you is certainly a lower limit estimate for almost everything I say. Well, let's look at an overall chart here and let me call your attention to two, two numbers that probably you can't see in the back of the room unless I move this up. I'm going to be using a variety of units, and that's a problem in the energy field. They're readily converted, of course, from ergs to quadrillion BTUs to hectajoules to barrels of oil equivalent or to metric tons of coal equivalent. But I will assume that you will be comfortable with a particular set of energy units, and I will use different sets at different times because that's the fashion in the field. Now, in 1995, the worldwide commercial energy use is given by this number here, 4 times 10 to the 27th. That's a very big number, ergs per year. Now, we have projections on population growth and energy conservation. They're, of course, all wrong, too, exactly as my overall prognosis is likely to be slightly wrong. Uh, and when we put together the ultimate limit of what people in the population area consider to be reasonable at this time, we will certainly go to 10 billion people and the energy use worldwide will become more or less uniform and lead to something like 2 times 10 to the 28th ergs per year as annual consumption. Now where is this going to come from? I will talk first about energy sources that are, in the strict sense of the word, not renewable. And at the top of that list is fusion energy, 
1 times 10 to the 38th ergs if we just use the, de the deuterium in water. And that means that we have at this estimated energy use rate something like 5 billion years of supply. The planet probably won't last much longer than that and therefore uh, we may last longer than that because we'll be going off into space. But the net result is that we have as you know a very enthusiastic group pushing fusion energy as the ultimate future supply source. But then there are people who are not very happy with the rate of progress there. I'm very disenchanted with the rate of progress because in my 1972 or 73 projection I had fusion energy on the table in 25 to 40 years. Now it's 25 years later and I have it on the table in 50 to 75 years from now. That's going the wrong way. So I'm not 100% sure about how that one is going to come out. Now let's look at the next one. Breeder reactors. These are nuclear breeder reactors including both thorium and uranium-233. And if you take this ratio here, you come out with a number of 20,000 years. Now that's a long, long time. And if we do need central power stations, large power stations, and did continue to de the development of breeder reactors, these are, are, are liquid metal fast breeder reactors. If we did this, there's no question that we could have a viable technology during the early part of the 21st century and there's every indication that this technology would be economically competitive and could be made entirely acceptable environmentally. This program has been pushed for many years in many countries but I'm sad to report that as of now even the French have scaled this program back. So the breeder reactor at this point in time is very much in cold storage. And when and, and how it will be revived I can't project. But I can tell you that one of the things that we are doing is assembling papers from the principal countries that have been involved in the breeder program, notably France, the United States, the United Kingdom, Japan and Germany and India where it's still being pushed very vigorously and I hope that by the end of this year in the journal that I edit there will be a special issue on what the techn technological status of the breeder is. Now as we go down the list we next come to fossil fuels and last year I was involved in uh, an independent commission on environmental education for grades K through 12. Uh, I don't need to tell you that the texts in envi in, on environmental education in, case, in grades K through 12 are a scandal. They are a scandal for two reasons. They are first of all badly biased politically but what is even worse they are full of factual errors. And I was absolutely astonished when I read in one book that we're going to run out of fossil fuels in 10 years. Now what are the real numbers? By fossil fuels I'm looking at the big picture. I mean oil, natural gas, I mean a shale oil, I mean oil from tar sands and all the other things that we know something about. And when you put all those together you get a huge number. 2 times 10 to the 31st ergs and if I divide that by the steady state estimated energy used I come up with a thousand years. We are not going to run out of fossil fuels. We may stop using them, but we will not run out of them for a long time. This is a resource estimate. If I made a reserve estimate out of it, it would still be several hundred years. And so I think you can forget about the notion that we are going to be in deep trouble because fossil fuels aren't around. That is absolutely not going to happen for a long time to come. Conventional nuclear reactors, the conventional fission reactors, there we do have a resource problem. You see the worldwide uranium used in water moderated fission reactors, that's only 2 times 10 to the 30th and if you were to divide that by this number 
that would only be about a hundred years of supply. Uh, but of course, there is a, a high probability that we will find new resources. Well, let me just say a few words about all the other things here. Uh, U.S. fossil fuel re re resources, well, that's smaller than the total, but still enough to take care of us for many, many years. The hydrothermal energy stored to a depth of 10 kilo kil kilometers worldwide. Again, we have a substantial number, but not a number that get, can make us comfortable for a very long period of time. Uh, hydrothermal energy stored down to three kilometers, that's only a number four times this number. There, are, there is a completely different set of solutions that begins with solar energy, and I'm changing units now. I'm now saying ergs per year. And that means as long as this number up here is bigger than this number, we can do it indefinitely if that's as much as we're going to be using ultimately. And you can see that the collection of solar technologies, which corresponds to the input solar energy, is many, many times, 2,500 times greater than what we will ultimately be using. So a tiny part of the incident solar energy will do the job. And all the other technologies here, which we call renewables, if they are solar-based, like wind energy, will also be very large, something like a thousand times what we need to uh, take care of the people of the world. So this will give you some idea of where we come from. And now I want to make what I think is the first and most important statement that I can make. At the present time, and for many years to come, actually used energy will be derived from a multiplicity of sources. I do not believe that there will ever be, or nor should there ever be, sole dependence on a particular energy resource. It is a mistake to argue that we are going to do it all with biomass, as the biomass enthusiasts do. It is a mistake to say that we will do it all with nuclear. We will not. We will have the mix that we have today and the mix that we have had in the past for many years to come. I think that's worth keeping in mind. Uh, let me now come to a couple of statements, first of all, about papers that are not yet published, that are in press, and I'm really taking advantage of my position here as editor. I know what's going to be published, and you haven't seen it, so what I'm telling you I know is new to you, and uh, that's why I'm doing it. For instance, I have seen a paper from Canada and another paper from Sweden making long-range pro future projections. And these projections say that we can get along in Canada and in Sweden without using fossil fuels, without using nuclear energy, using only renewables. And that we can do this by having proper energy conservation and higher energy utilization efficiency. Well, when I see papers like this, the, about the only thing that I have a right to insist on is that the authors present their models in enough detail so that the reader has a chance of taking it apart subsequently. And these papers do have that feature, and what I think of them, I'm going to tell you at the end of the lecture. <laughs> now, that's the story on, on modeling. That's the story on trying to project, to force the energy system according to some, what shall I say, preconceived notion of what is good and what is bad. And then you don't have the mix that I'm talking about. Then you are doing something that is very special, and you're doing it more efficiently, and you are doing it with less energy use. Well, when I see that, I somehow have to contrast that with what's going on in the real world. Now here's an example of the real world. This is another paper you can't have seen because it hasn't been published yet. This paper is, refers to Shanghai. 
And in Shanghai, if you look at the last column there, there is a list of, or oh, there are numbers given for the kilograms of carbon emitted per dollar, this happened to be 1990 US dollars, of gross domestic product. Now what you want is very low emission for very large amount of energy. Now let's compare what is really happening in Shanghai with, with, with what we are doing in the OEDC countries, the developed countries. And if you take this number, that's 0.85 kilograms of carbon in 1990 US, per 1990 US dollar. That's what it takes in Shanghai. 14 cents is what it takes in the US. They're putting out six times as much carbon dioxide in China, in Shanghai, with newly developed plants per dollar of product as we are putting out here. And I don't have to tell you that the notion that we are going to be meeting the CO2 estimated reductions that I have been agreed on in Rio and elsewhere is very much in doubt when you see things of this sort. Now, it turns out that during the last year, a group of very distinguished economists began to wrestle with this problem. And uh, they went about their business very systematically. They wrote a letter to all their colleagues, and they said, sign on the bottom line that this is the way it ought to be. And I was astonished. Well, I'm not astonished. I, I was not astonished. Because considering the prestige of the people who circulated and wrote the letter, it came out about the way it should have. They had a three-part statement. The first one was that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, assertion that the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on climate change is valid. They did not even bother to say that significant dissent about which you're going to learn a great deal today and tomorrow here, I'm sure, remains. Next, they said that sound economic analysis shows that there are policy options that would slow climate change without harming the American living standard. Now that's a nice vague statement and I have to agree with that provided that statement refers to technological change like building nuclear breeder reactors or building transportation systems using fuel cells. But they didn't bother to put those details in. They just said it can be done. And then their final statement, we all agree with, is a statement that the free market is better than a market run by the government. Well, I don't have any problem with that one. That's for sure <laughs> the truth. Uh, let me now show you one other chart, which m maybe you remember from last year. I think it's very important that you recognize that the example that I gave of Shanghai, for Shanghai, is not at all out of line with what is happening in Southeast Asia, where the use of oil, the use of natural gas, the use, especially the use of coal, is growing at an astronomical rate and is not controlled better than it is controlled in the West. At best it will be controlled as it is in the West. To take an example, the coal use will grow by the year 2010, which isn't very far away, to about 3.1 billion metric tons per year. And you can compare that with the US value for 1995, which is 0.7 billion metric tons per year. That is, they're going to be using four and a half times as much coal as we use here. And that story is repeated in the other categories. And that's something that I believe is very important to recognize that we are not alone. And when we make regulations and pass laws and the people in the Netherlands go on a stringent no CO2 or great CO2 reduction program, that does not reflect what is happening where it really, really counts. After all, there are only, what, about 12 million people in the Netherlands. There are just a few more in Southeast Asia, which includes China, India, <laughs> Japan, which, which is, however, an OECD country. So things are not going 
to go exactly the way we project in that department and I think we are going to have to live with an anticipation of rapidly escalating CO2 and I was very glad to see that someone is looking carefully at what happens to biomass growth in that environment. Now obviously what we would like to have is a worldwide model that we can use as a guide on what is happening and there are models around at various stages of sophistication. I think perhaps the best one is the model at the International Institute of, for Applied Systems Analysis. That is the, the institute that was founded by uh, Molotov and John Foster Dulles when they set, got together one day some years ago and they decided there are problems bigger than East-West differences and so they founded this institute and very distinguished work has been done at this institute since oh, about 25 years on food, energy, and population. These are essentially systems modelers. This work that of Yasov for the World Energy Council allows for resource, economic, environmental, and rate of market penetration constraints for 11 regions into which the world has been divided. And they make a projection also to the year 2100. That's a good model. Now we have some other models, notably one from the US EPA and an Indian colleague uh, who took, took that apart recently and she thought that the US EPA model, especially for CO2 emissions, was just plain wrong for just about all of the regions of the world. So model building is certainly something that we ought to do provided we don't make a gospel out of the model. We check the model against the real world, we revise it, and we learn as we go along to make a better model. That's the prescription. Now let me turn to another topic, namely the U.S. energy futures, which I haven't yet said much about. Now you can do that in two ways. You can first of all look at the past, which is a very good idea. Or you can just make guesses about the future, which is not a very good idea. The American Physical Society Energy Environment, Environment Committee put out a report on energy, the forgotten crisis. I think it's sort of interesting that they use that phrase. Actually, I don't think energy is the forgotten crisis. Energy is the relabeled crisis. When we talk about environmental problems now, from my provincial perspective, we're really talking about energy issues again. But let's use their terms and there are some interesting things, that, some in interesting facts that are summarized by them. For instance, they note that the ratio of income of gross domestic product to energy use increased by a factor of one and a half from 1973 to 1995. And then when they looked at this more carefully, they found that the increase all came to, during the early part of the period, that when they looked from 1986 to 1995, which is a nine-year period, there was almost no change at all. There's a conclusion that is implicit in there. When we started to conserve energy, we did all the easy things, and after we did all the easy things, we found that it was very difficult. And that's exactly what these numbers reflect. It's interesting to remember that with all this conservation that's been going on, energy use and electricity, I'm, I'm sorry, income and electricity, and electricity use have remained very tightly coupled. The more the income's gone up, the greater the energy use has been. There's n the, the electrical energy use has been. There has not been a dip, no decrease with time, with all the efforts that we have put on, on this uh, issue. Now, nowadays, of course, if you want to be intelligent, you don't have to wait for the American Physical Society to come out with a report. What you do is you sit behind your computer and you put in the call number of the Energy Information Agency and out come 50 charts. And they are not charts from last November, they are charts from the last month preceding the time when you dialed in. Let me show you some data from there because they're informative 
in telling you some of our, of our problems in the US. This is a chart. I just got this chart at the end of March out of my computer. I didn't do any work at all. You don't have to do any work anymore, assuming they do their job well, and they probably do it quite well. And what do you see here? You see, first of all, that our trade balance for energy was totally negative. That it's been costing us a lot of money to import energy. Now, that wouldn't be the case, of course, if we had nuclear breeder reactors, because we could use our domestic resources. We wouldn't need all this stuff. And the non-energy balance of trade went negative around 1982 or 83. So that's kind of an interesting number. It makes you feel that uh, you've learned something. And then you can, you can look at another number here. What are the major sources of energy? And all these numbers are now in quadrillion BTUs. That's 10 to the 15th BTU. So if you don't like that number, in ectajoules, which are 10 to the 18th joules. But you can easily convert this into something civilized like barrels of oil. But I won't do that right now. But the point is that crude oil is one of our major sources because about 100% of the transportation sector is fueled that way. So you, you get some, uh, some idea of what our energy supply is. The coal use is almost entirely for electricity generation. Now let's see, I don't want to bore you with all of these, but there may be one more that I should show you. I want to show the one that leads to this obvious conclusion that energy conservation was very easy when we began because we did everything wrong and it's gotten very hard because now we have pretty much done the easy things. Let's look at this one here. This is consumption, production and imports for the US. Consumption is pretty much, well with a dip here, produced by an economic downturn and then going up. Our domestic production is pretty level. Our imports are rising since about 1985, continuously. Well, I think I will not show you more of these because uh, it'll just disturb you to see what we are doing. <laughs> For instance, if you look at passenger cars, you have a, the dismal fact that the miles per gallon are going up, the mileage driven per car is going up, and the fuel consumption in gallons per car is not going down at all. These are just features of our way of life. Now I want to say a few words about renewable energy. I've worked on renewable energy. As I said, I used to have a company in the biomass business during the Carter administration. I mean, I had it in the sense that I was not a major owner and I was on the board of directors and we were counting our chips and we were getting rich very quickly <laughs> until uh, Reagan became president and then he, the administration, decided that uh, uh, the government support would not be there, that if you couldn't do it on your own, uh, you were in the wrong business. And it took us about two weeks after the administration changed to go out of business. So we did that very, <laughs> very efficiently. Uh, I was in the energy conservation business in San Diego. That was my first job. I founded the Center for what was called Energy Research at the University of California here, and we got a $300,000 subsidy from the San Diego Gas and Electric Company, not because they liked us or wanted to give it to us, but because the California Utility Commission told them they had to do that unless, if they wanted to stay in business. So we ran a major program. We had undergraduates, very smart people, obviously, because they haven't gotten degrees yet. <laughs> We had them run, running around San Diego and looking at uh, picking out homes that had uh, very leaky walls, very leaky electric uh, outlets, and other mischief in them. 
And then with the funds that we were supplied by the San Diego Gas and Electric Company, we fixed all this up. We made the houses tight. And we were sure that we were conserving a great deal of energy. And then we looked at the bills as they came in to the San Diego Gas and Electric Company, and we found no conservation at all. So we went back into the field. When I say we, I mean these smart undergraduates, and they interviewed all these people where they had implemented this energy conservation charge. And to make a long story short, what we learned was that when people found that the holes could be plugged up and that it was more comfortable to be in the room, they turned up the thermostat so that they would be really comfortable. <laughs> and the net result was no conservation at all. So, so when it comes to making projections about the energy business, I tend to be very conservative. Very conservative. Now let me talk about my main subject which is the US energy supply, where is it going to come from? And I apologize for the fact that I'm going to be showing you a very busy view graph that is somewhat difficult to digest, but I will highlight it as best I can to give you the flavor of what is at issue here. It must be admitted that during the Carter years, uh, the people who drafted the long-range energy development plans did a wonderful job of identifying possible technologies. And I say that with considerable bias because I was working in the Carter White House on an NRC study in defining all these technologies. And here I'm almost 25 years later. And I don't know of any significant new technology that I would have to add to this list that we made up that long time ago. I look upon that time as the golden era of energy research. Uh, not energy development, energy research. There's a big difference there. One is for the benefit of the college professors and the research community, and the other one for the benefit of the public. Those are different things. <laughs> Now what are some of the things we looked at? We looked at offshore and mainland oil and gas exploration. And as we projected, these technologies are very important. They continue to this day, and they will continue into the future. No problem there. Increased coal production. We were then not that worried about CO2 buildup and climate change. That came later. Uh, Construction of the Alaskan pipeline as a near-term project, as you know, that was done. Construction of plans to recover more oil from Canadian tar sands by conventional methods. Well, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but in Alberta there is a very large, uh, I think something like a million barrel per day pro project to uh, convert tar sand oil into usable oil. That project's been going on for a long time, and it is reasonably competitive with other sources of oil. Uh, those tar sands are unique. We had a major program in Utah done by very able people that never got off the ground because the tar sands were not located in quite the same way that they were in Alberta. Well, there are many other fossil fuel technologies listed here. One of them listed was magnetohydrodynamic power conversion. I should have been aware of the fact that that wasn't going to work because we had a joint program with the Russians where we had no secrets from each other. And I, that should have been a tip off that this one shouldn't have been on the list. <laughs> it's, been, it's been dropped. That's a technology we no, no longer pursue. Then there is under hydroelectric, geothermal, and wind technologies. Well, you know about this. We are, building hydroelectric power generation facilities about as rapidly as we are able to. Uh, hydrothermal power stations, well, we have them in the Imperial Valley. There is a fantastic resource next door to us, but it's kind of hard to get to and, and somewhat expensive. Nevertheless, that's a slowly growing recovery program that's still going on. Uh, tidal basins, well, only the French do that. Nobody else has ever really gotten a big enough program off the ground to make a dent in that. Wind-driven power generators, well, we, you know we have them all over California. And the windmills turn when the wind blows properly. 
But the windmills don't. They are now not windmills, they're wind turbines. They're much better than windmills. The trouble with them is that they have begun to develop fissures and cracks and fatigue failures and they are likely to turn out to be much, le much more costly than we estimated when they were put in. This is a somewhat controversial statement, by the way. And the nuclear reactor development, uh, we have essentially terminated the construction of light water nuclear reactors. The high temperature gas cooled reactors, which are a product of General Atomic here in San Diego, only small units have been built. Uh, most of them are research reactors. The largest one was a 300 megawatt unit in Colorado, which performed very badly because they were still learning how to do this, and that was shut down. Uh, liquid metal fast breeder reactors, that's that 20,000 year horizon, uh, tragically uh, 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 at least temporary casualty everywhere but in India. I have seen all of the papers that I mentioned and it's only the Indians who still seem to be going uh, full blast after this very promising technology. The gas cool breeders are essentially finished and the only thing wrong with fusion reactors is that it's not clear uh, in which century we're going to have those. <laughs> Under solar energy development, there are two great successes. We do have solar water heaters and solar space heaters, but that's epsilon of the energy system. They don't amount to much, and they're really not new. I had an aunt living in Florida who had a house that was built in 1920, and she had a solar water heater in 1920, so that's really not fantastic new technology. That's old, old hat. The, on the, the power generation of solar sea stations, we were very enthusiastic about that. That looked like a wonderful way to go. And I'm sorry to say that almost all of the work on that field has been terminated. Uh, this looked like a great idea because it was compatible with one of the wonderful goals that we all have in the energy business, which is a hydrogen technology. Now don't mix up a hydrogen technology with an energy source. Hydrogen is an energy carrier. You have to make it with energy. After you have it, there's some wonderful things you can do with it, like run around a fuel cell powered car that emits no, no pollutants whatsoever. Uh, Ballard in Canada built a bus that has hydrogen, compressed hydrogen. I've ridden that bus. It's a, it's a nice transportation vehicle. It's a, it's a great, great uh, system. And the, the conversion efficiency for fuel cells is extremely high. It is probably six to eight times better than for an ordinary internal combustion engine, which has something to do with the way these uh, electrochemical systems work. They are not constrained by the uh, Carnot energy efficiency, so we can get very high efficiency from those. Uh, in fact, the fuel, fuel cells is one of the projects on about which I was enthusiastic at the end of the Bush administration and at the beginning of the Clinton administration, as well as during the Reagan administration, because I had the pleasure of conducting for the Department of Energy a major study on the commercialization of fuel cells. However, if you ask me, when are we going to see fuel cells in the private transportation sector? When are you going to be able to go out and buy a car that's fuel cell powered with this high efficiency and is totally clean. I would say that it's very unlikely to happen before the year 2010, if then. It's not going to happen quickly and that leads me to another topic about which I will have to say a few words which is uh, one of these widely touted programs by the administration on how to clean up the urban environment which I think would be a great idea. And finally here, we have the development of land-based solar generating plants, which would include photovoltaics and solar thermal systems. We once built a solar thermal system in California at Barstow. If you put this on the right scale, we spent something like $35,000 per installed kilowatt compared with a coal burner that might cost $700 per installed kilowatt. 
So it was a very expensive experiment and there is really no follow-up on this activity. These renewable technologies are improving, but they are still not economically competitive with fossil fuels or nuclear energy at currently low fossil fuel prices and without externalizing a cost for the CO2 emissions that we get from the fossil fuels. Now you can play games with that kind of economics, but in the free market and without subsidy, the solar technologies, except for the solar water and space heating, are really not near term. They are going to be built, I believe, sometime in the future. Let me show you the, the chart. This is the amended chart. Now I know that all of you will immediately make total sense out of this because it's, <laughs> it's so easy to understand. But let me just give you one or two examples of what, what I'm talking about here. Uh, let me take uh, the nuclear, uh, well, let me take the fusion reactors. The fusion reactors are designated here as N5. And you see the estimate that I have now is that they aren't likely to enter the commercial market before about 2050. That's 50 years in the future and that's a big change from where we were earlier. Another example would be the uh, nuclear, the breeder reactor. And there, there is a deferral also and that deferral is the result of lack of funding. So there are different reasons why these things slipped. The so solar technology slipped because they simply weren't competitive. So what we have here is a multiplicity of technologies for different time frames and given enough time I'd be happy to defend each entry here and this, this chart reflects above all what I said at the beginning the multiplicity of technologies that we are going to need in order to get our energy supplies worldwide for the people around the globe, especially the people who have used almost no energy at all compared to us and who are now in the stage of rapid economic development for which they do need large energy supplies. This chart that I just showed you is best read in private and quiet. <laughs> Let me say a few words about now about the ve vehicular problem. We have a major effort was announced with great fanfare at the White House. I don't know if you can read all this. This major effort goes by a modest name, Partnership for a New Generation of Vehicles. PNGV, involving the government and all the automotive companies. The total budget allocated to that when it was opened in 1993 was six hundred million dollars per year from all sources. Now I used to be a consultant at General Motors and I remember that when they had a fancy tail on a car and they wanted to redesign the car, the style people, they wanted to get rid of it. How much money did that take? Well, it took $3 billion just to straighten out the tail. And here we are talking about entirely new power systems and we don't spend $3 billion in less than, in, 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 in five years. That's what it takes. So it's very difficult from that perspective to see this as a serious effort. And of course, it didn't take us very long. This year already, this partnership for a new generation of vehicles was described as being unable to meet either the technical objective, the cost, the, the schedule, or there were other problems regardless of schedule, with one exception. And that's an interesting exception. We, did, we were able to clean up, or we are able to clean up, the diesel engines. These are, of course, largely commercial now. So that was not a major redesign like the fuel cell which appears in the next column and for which we, you see these square boxes 
Those square boxes mean, means the probability of doing it is low. That's another way of saying it, we're not going to do it. <laughs> so here we have this program that has one success, and then what happened? The EPA came out with new guidelines for particulate emissions, and if these guidelines are implemented, we aren't going to be building the diesel engines at all. So we've got a program that at this juncture uh, must be judged to be not entirely successful. <laughs> Let me talk about another energy pro problem, even though it isn't described as an energy problem. This is the physical heritage of the Cold War. Excess weapons plutonium. A paper given, or an article recently published, by no less an authority than Wolfgang Panofsky. And everything he says is fine, except all the numbers are right, except when he gets all through, he says we have to decide what to do with this plut plutonium, but we shouldn't relate it to the energy problem. Well, I can't accept anything like that, because as I say, everything to me is related to the energy problem. And I look at his numbers, and I see that if we did relate it to the energy problem, and we were generating electricity at six mils per kilowatt hour, that plutonium resource would have a value of about 66 billion dollars. Uh, that's money, real money. And an easy way to get that would be to build a high temperature gas cooled re reactor, which we could do for a billion dollars because we have a long tradition of building research reactors and I said, as I said, one prototype reactor. That could be on stream in a couple of years and that reactor would actually utilize 80 percent of this 60 billion dollar resource. And that's the kind of a windfall that I think we ought to take advantage of rather than saying that Plutonium disposal, like everything connected with nuclear energy, belongs into an exalted sphere and can't be related to anything real, like money. <laughs> Let me say a few words now about biomass. As I said, this is a subject very dear to my heart. And uh, a few years ago, there was a major conference in Vienna worldwide conference. They produced three thick volumes on biomass and I was very happy to write a review of that although I didn't quite believe where they were going. First of all let me tell you that something's been lost from biomass because when we were in the business during the Carter administration we called biomass a BTU bush or erg growth. Those words have disappeared and I think with that some, some real fetching phrases for the biomass. But let me tell you what the international consensus at the meeting was. First of all, they must make it economically competitive without subsidies. Everybody agreed with that. They were not sure when this was going to come about. But they, they had estimates of 10% of total energy use by 2010, uh, 20 to 30 percent by 2020 and more recently I've seen up to 60 percent by the year 2050. Now mind you biomass is now used worldwide. It's a primary energy source. It's not a commercial energy source. We get about 12 percent of the total worldwide energy. That's only an estimate from uh, fuel, wood, crop residues and the like, especially in the less developed countries. But when you look at depth in this, then there are problems with this scenario because the people who are doing the current biomass use and who are studying what is happening there, notably in India and in Bangladesh, are finding that when they take the fuel, wood and the crop residues and burn them, <laughs> for say electricity generation that the soil gets impoverished and by the time you look at what is required to build a sustainable biomass system it's not all that clear and that's of course the main message that I think I want to leave you with it's not at all clear that any of these things will work quite the way we plan 
And because probably none of them will work quite the way we plan, it is certain that this multiplicity of energy activities will remain with us. Personally, I do not believe that six, a 60% goal by 2050 or even a 30% goal is going to be achievable. But I am glad that we are looking at this now as a large-scale technology, which in the chart that I have belongs into the 1998 to 2025 time frame where we are building not small energy plantations. We had an energy plantation way back in 1976, but, but a big one. And we are looking at the economic viability of this without subsidies. And that, I think, is real progress. There is a book out written by T.B. Johansson and other well-known proponents of renewable energy. It was published in 1993. Needless to say, they can do everything with renewable energy and they don't need any fossil fuels, nuclear or what have you. Uh, an Australian by the name of Trainer uh, wrote a rather astute review of this and I won't give you the, the full measure of what he says. But his opening statement is that this book reinforces the common assumption that there will be no major difficulty in replacing present energy sources. And then Trainer presents reasons for rejecting this argument. And they are well reasoned. This was published. And there was no rebuttal ever published to Trainer's critique, which is a little bit suspicious. <laughs> now, I want to say a few words about what I think ought to be done for the US. What should our energy be? Now, I, I am here, uh, uh, I think, as a recent renegade. You have to remember that I did work for four administrations, including the present one, on fuel cells. But what I say now is totally out of line with uh, the sustainability doctrine or with these ideas that we can get along without either, either nuclear energy or fossil fuel energy. In fact, I have a simple sentence here which summarizes my view on that subject. I think the idea that we are going to be able to take care of 10 billion people's well-being, economic well-being, health, education, and what most of us consider to be standard of living, uh, low infant mortality, attractive housing and all that. I consider that to be based on wishful thinking, hypothetical innovations, unwarranted extrapolations, and a celebration of the sustainability doctrine. It just isn't going to work. So what should we do? I think we should adopt an attitude of what works is beautiful even if it's big. I think that would be a very good first theorem. And what we should do is do a total turnaround in our country on our policy towards nuclear reactors. We should first of all build passively safe nuclear reactors. You know what a passively safe nuclear reactor is? No matter how you upset it, the laws of physics are such that you can't have a runaway problem. We know how to build reactors like that. Why haven't we built them? Well, I'll come to that. I have a punchline at the end that will explain that. The other thing we ought to do is have a, a dedicated pursuit of breeder technology because if we ever decide that we need central power station generators over the long term, 20,000 years somehow so sounds to me like an acceptably long time to be stuck with a good technology. And it's very interesting to ask why that one is in disfavor when fusion reactors, which are supposed to last five billion years, are in favor. Uh, I have heard the suspicion voice that they are in favor because nobody believes we can do them. And the other ones we know we can do. And I think there is a third major problem that is consonant with what the Clinton administration was trying to do with this vehicular problem. I think that our standard of living, the way we have grown up, demands that we have access to personal transportation vehicles. 
uh, in Southern California, it's almost unthinkable to do without them. These personal transportation vehicles could be of two types. They could be battery powered with recharge from a nu central nuclear uh, generated electricity, or they could be fuel cells. Of course, my bias is that they should be fuel cells. That's because I've worked more on fuel cells than on batteries. But either of those is an acceptable option. The result of going that way would be to clean up the urban environments. And I'm certain that there's not a person here who doesn't support that as a desirable long-range strategy. And the, the only thing I can say is that it was apparently recognized as needed, but then the support for it was so ridiculously inadequate that nothing came off. Now, I was originally going to quit at this point, and then it occurred to me that I couldn't really do that, because as soon as I quit at this point, someone would get up and say, well, you're a pro-nuke, and you know that we don't know how to dispose of nuclear waste. Now, it so happens that the June 1997 issue of Physics Today is totally devoted to the nuclear waste disposal problem. And there is a very fine article in there by a Swiss gentleman, McCombie, a very responsible person for taking care of nuclear material in Switzerland. And he says, gives various reasons why we haven't done this job. Let me now summarize what the actual status is on nuclear waste disposal. Forty years ago, that's in 1957, there was an NRC committee, that's the National Academy of Science, National Academy of Engineering, later Institute of Medicine group, looking at the waste disposal problem. They proposed and stated in 1957, 40 years ago, that it was their view that there was no problem with disposing of high-level nuclear waste and I'm assuming you know what I mean by that. It's the kind of waste you don't want to have around because it's highly radioactive. Disposing of it, of it in deep geological structures, that that was the way to go. Today, we have a program to make a decision 10 to 15 years from now on where we put the high-level nuclear waste. So there is an interlude of about 50, 55 years between defining the way to go, and that definition has been repeated many, many times by many other groups looking at the same problem of nuclear waste disposal, that deep geological structures is the way to go. So the Swiss gentleman first of all asked, the Europeans don't have quite all the hang-ups we have. They, those hang-ups are contagious, but they're not that contagious. So he, he says, why haven't we done it in Europe? Well, he says there's a very simple reason for it. We don't have enough waste to justify that kind of a program. And why don't they have enough waste? Of the total waste, uh, nuclear reactor waste around, the English, the Canadians, the French, and we have about equal shares. Not that we, I'm not talking about weapons waste. Now that's another category of, of study. I'm talking about <laughs> nuclear reactor waste. Usually, after a reactor is shut down, you take the waste material and you put it into monitored storage and you allow cool down of the radioactivity. And the Europeans have chosen a long period of cool down. And we've chosen a 10 year period of cool down. And the net result is that we have much more urgency for disposing of the high level nuclear waste than the Europeans have. But aside from that, you might ask, why hasn't it been done? And Mr. McCombie, I'm going to paraphrase him now, he's a very polite gentleman and I'm not, so I think that you'll like my summary better than you would like his. Essentially, he says that there are too many interests against showing that high-level nuclear waste can be safely disposed of for the following reasons. The news media are against it because they're going to lose a preferred discussion topic for creating public apprehension. The companies are against it 
because they're going to have to cough up money to construct real facilities instead of talking about the real facilities that they need, it need to be constructed. The government officials and politicians are against it because they want to continue active research to find the perfect solution rather than a good solution. Then we come to the researchers at the universities and the national laboratories and in industry and they are against it because they will be deprived of long-term funding for research on high-level waste disposal which they now enjoy. And finally, the environmental activists are against it because they are going to lose a key issue against nuclear energy because they won't be able to go around saying it's never been done. Now, fighting a compact like that, as you can see, is a tough job. And I think the only way that those, that kind of opposition will be overcome is if our standard of living and our economic well-being are put in jeopardy by not doing it. And that's not a very happy thought to leave you with, but in the meantime, I still think we ought to learn how to build these breeder reactors to take care of a long time frame. Thank you.